You're listening to the Qalam Institute podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Qalam is pleased to announce that admissions for the next Qalam seminary intake are now open. For more information, please visit qalaminstitute.org. Bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Shall I continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Asira to Nabawiyya, the prophetic biography. In the previous session, which was um, a few weeks ago, apologize for the um, irregularity, inshallah we'll be continuing now, hopefully consistently. Um, we talked about the beginning of the third year of Hijrah. The beginning of the third year of Hijrah was basically, um, to some degree, to, to quite an extent actually, uh, a reaction to the Battle of Badr that the couple of incidents that the Prophet Wasallam and the Muslims that they dealt with was first and foremost kind of a small raid by Abu Sufyan and a few of the Quraysh, a few of the Meccans in which they burned down an orchard and even killed an Ansari and another ally of the Ansar. Uh, there were a couple of incidents then where the Prophet Wasallam and the Muslims, they pursued them and went after them. And then of course there was the issue of Banu Qaynuqa, the Jewish tribe that lived within the, within the uh, boundaries of the city of Medina. Um, and that was all a reaction to the Battle of Badr because some of the Jewish tribes that lived in and around Medina became very agitated after the Battle of Badr because they naturally felt very intimidated. And I talked about this at length before, but I'll just reiterate for a second here. The Battle of Badr was very, very interesting in, in the sense that up till that point, the Muslims were looked at, the Muslim community, even the establishment of Medina was looked at as just... Um, you know, a very small, insignificant uh, occurrence. It was looked at as, as if there was just this very small, uh, you know, eccentric group of people, um, and it didn't seem to have any type of significance or relevance to the greater Arabian Peninsula. Um, and it was deemed to be an irrelevant uh, occurrence. But once the Battle of Badr actually occurred and happened, Mecca was shown to be vulnerable. Quraysh, uh, it was proven now that Quraysh could be defeated. And not only could Quraysh be defeated, but Quraysh could be defeated by this very small, poor, helpless band of individuals, of people. And so that very greatly started to, that basically put all of Arabia on alert. Uh, in regards to the Muslims. And so a lot of these events were happening as a consequence, as a reaction to that. Now as I mentioned, of course the Battle of Badr, once the Battle of Badr happened, then you have to understand that Medina and Mecca are basically at war at this point. Um, the Muslims and the Quraysh basically are at war with one another. On top of that, then you have Abu Sufyan raiding Medina, burning down an orchard and killing a man, killing two people actually, a Muslim and the ally of the, uh, one of, uh, a, a member of a tribe that is allied to the Muslims. So they are basically announcing that we are very interested in continuing uh, this war, this battle. So at that particular time, there's the incident that is referred to as Sariya to Zayd ibn Haritha. Sariya to Zayd ibn Haritha, this was the campaign or the expedition of Zayd ibn Haritha, the adopted son of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's also known as Suhba to Abi Sufyan or Suhba to Safwan, Safwan bin Umayyah. What occurred at this particular time was that the Quraysh themselves, Abu Sufyan himself had escalated the issue by raiding Medina. So now the Quraysh became very concerned. They needed to travel for the sake of their business. Um, at the beginning of the year, they needed to travel to Asham in order to conduct their business. But their route to Asham passed by very close to Al Madinatul Munawwara, the, the city of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So because of this, you know, there was a lot of paranoia amongst the higher ups in Mecca, amongst the leadership of the Quraysh. That what are we going to do? How are we going to go about our business? now that you know the issue is the way that it is right we're both trying to get each other so how are we going to conduct business how are we going to travel safely so they decided at that particular time Safan ibn Umayyah Safan ibn Umayyah who was one of the surviving leaders of the Quraysh um, and had kind of inherited a seat at the table after all the so many of the leaders of Quraysh had died in the battle of Badr he was going to be leading a again, kind of an investment campaign 
to grow the war fund of the Quraysh and the Meccans. And so he was carrying a lot of silver, a lot of valuables, a lot of merchandise with them. Um, and many investments were made from some of the leadership of the Quraysh. And they were going to be traveling. What ended up happening is that the, one of the individuals from Mecca who was aware of the fact that this um, caravan was going to be going to do business, um, he, Nu'aim bin Mas'ud, um, who was from the Meccans, who was from the Quraysh, he ended up visiting Medina. He had some friendships, he had some old friends um, that he had in Medina. He was also very close to some of the people of Banu Nadir. So he ended up visiting just on a personal visit. And he was granted protection and he was able to come and visit. While he was visiting, at that time, you know, basically they were, uh, they were hanging out. The alcohol was free flowing. They started drinking. Eventually he got very drunk and he ended up spilling the beans. He ended up talking about the fact that, you know, we're putting together all this money and we're going to be traveling to Asham to do some business. But the problem is we can't go by here anymore because of Muhammad and his people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what we're planning to do is to take an alternate route. We've been able to figure out an alternate route and we're going to be taking that route. And he basically spilled the beans. One of the people who was there at that time came and informed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sulayt uh, Salit um, Ibn Nu'man uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and this is of course before the prohibition of wine and alcohol, but Salit Ibn Nu'man radiallahu anhu who was present in that gathering, he came and he informed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that this is, this is what's going on with the Quraysh and this is what they're planning on doing. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam immediately sent Zayd Ibn Haritha with as many people that they could get together uh, on a short notice and sent them out to intercept this caravan. Because if you remember, after they had raided Medina, burned down an orchard and killed two people, they had pursued them but were not able to get a hold of them. So this was, this was retaliation, justified retaliation in that regard. So Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu and a group of Muslims, they go, they are able to intercept the caravan, they're a, they acquire a lot of the silver and the money and the investments that they're carrying with them and bring it back to Medina. And some of the narrations mention as well that one person was taken prisoner. His name was Furat ibn Hayyan. He was taken prisoner. They arrived back in Medina. And by and far, this was probably the largest acquisition the Muslims had made up to this particular point. And it was very well needed, very much needed reprieve from a lot of the very difficult circumstances that were present in Medina. Right? Because if you think about it, the community of the, the community of the Ansar, right? The Medinan Arabs, right? Pre-Islamically, they were farmers. They were date farmers. Very simple, humble people. They didn't have much to their name. Then you have an entire community of the Muhajirun who has left Mecca and now arrived in Medina. Penniless, homeless, all right, so now they are, the Ansar have taken them in, who already were hand to mouth to begin with. Then you have the majority of Muslims, or a lot, some of them at least, the majority of them would actually come later, but many of the Muslims who were in Habasha and Abyssinia have also now come and arrived in Medina as well. So you have another whole group of outsiders, again, who are arriving basically penniless, homeless, um, and they arrive there and they're taken in as well. So the, and then you have something like the Battle of Badr happening where everybody exhausts every you know, uh, ounce that they have. So the community in Medina is really struggling financially. And so this was the largest acquisition. It was around 100,000 darahim. 100,000 darahim, 100,000 gold coins. Because as Surah Al-Anfal had informed us at the t that was revealed at the time of Badr, uh, All right? That a fifth of what is acquired basically is set aside for the, state of the, uh, for the affairs of the state. Right? And it is at the discretion of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is used for the Bayt al-Mal, it is used for the running of the affairs of the state, it is used for supporting the family and the families and the households of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because they cannot accept zakat. Right? So it's used for all these necessary functions uh, in the community. So that's the khumus, one 
uh, fifth, 20% that is set aside for the affairs of the state. The, the Justi Khums is mentioned within the narrations of uh, Al Waqidi that just the Khums was 20,000 Darahim, which basically means that it was 100,000 Darahim, 100,000 silver coins. Uh, that were acquired at this particular time. So this was by and far the largest acquisition the Muslims uh, had been blessed with up to this particular point. The one prisoner who was taken, Furat ibn Hayyan, that again was not some indiscretion at the part of the Muslims. What proves that? He accepted Islam. All right, so he was, acquired, he was taken prisoner, he was taken to Medina, he was released by the Muslims in Medina, you're free to go back to Mecca, and basically he said, no, I'd rather stay. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, ashadu wa Muhammad Rasulullah. All right, so he ended up becoming Muslim. And so the, all of this basically transpired in the month of Jumad al-Ula of the third year of the Prophet Sallallahu residence in Medina. So about 28 months after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had arrived in the city of Medina. So a little over two years now. Um, and so in about two, two and a half years, this is where the state of affairs has reached as far as the Muslims are concerned. There, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari rahimahullah ta'ala, he also mentions uh, at this particular point that in uh, Rabi'ul al-Awwal of this uh, year, the third year of Hijrah, in the month of Rabi'ul al-Awwal, this is also the month in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conducted the marriage of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu with his third eldest daughter, Umm Kulthum binti Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you remember, if you recall, Uthman ibn Affan was sent back by the Prophet ﷺ, was told to stay in Medina during the Battle of Badr to look after the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, the wife of Uthman, who was very ill at that time, Ruqayyah radiallahu anha. When the news of the victory of Badr arrived back in Medina at the hands of Zayd ibn Haritha, they were, he saw the Muslims, Uthman bin Affan, his own son, Usama ibn Zayd, and a group of Muslims returning back from Baqiya after having buried the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, performing her janazah, she, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, passed away while they were blessed with victory at Badr. So it was very bittersweet for the Prophet ﷺ in that regard. It was a great victory, but he came back to basically mourn his daughter. So after some time had transpired and passed, the Prophet ﷺ at that point in time married his third daughter, Umm Kulthum, to Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, thereby granting Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu the title and the honor of being Dhu Nurain, the one who married the two daughters of the Prophet ﷺ. Of course, one after another, subsequently, not at the same time, as that's not permissible, but he basically married the a younger sister after the elder sister had passed away. Uh, he married her and he's the only one. In fact, uh, Ibn Kathir ta'ala mentions that there is, I mean, of course there's, one could argue that we don't have a lot of information in that regard, but then what could counter argue? Well, exactly, maybe because there is no other precedent of this. But basically, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala says, I even looked within the Israeliyat and I could not find anywhere, any evidence, even in the Israeliyat, that anyone had ever married two daughters of any prophet or messenger, uh, alayhim salam. And so that is an honor and a distinction of Uthman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He is the only one. One, from humanity, from the history of mankind, who has been able to marry two, um, you know, uh, daughters of any prophet or any messenger, or even vice versa. There's never been a woman who was married to two sons of a prophet uh, or a messenger, one after another. So he's the only one who has had that type of a relationship with any prophet or any messenger throughout human history. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala makes this particular point. And of course, um, the Prophet sallallahu would comment, um, and Umm Kuthum actually, radiallahu ta'ala anha, would also pass away during the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu and the Prophet ﷺ would actually comment um, that if I had another daughter, when Umm Kulthum passes away, the Prophet ﷺ said, if I had another daughter to marry, because of course Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha was married to Ali bin Abi Talib in the second year as we talked about, but he commented at that time, if I had another daughter to marry, I would have married her to Uthman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, because that is the caliber and the quality of an individual that he is. So that is the um, next incident that basically occurred during the third year of Hijrah. 
Before we, we're very close to discussing the Battle of Uhud. Before we discuss the Battle of Uhud, which we'll probably delve into uh, in the next session, or at least start discussing in the next session, there's one major incident in the third year that can very well be described as the precursor to the Battle of Uhud. So how and why the Battle of Uhud occurred um, is tied to another incident of, during the third year. So this involves discussing a particular individual who lived right outside of Al-Madinatul Munawwara. His name was Kaab ibn al-Ashraf. Kaab ibn al-Ashraf. His father, he, he was a very interesting individual. His father was Arab. His father was from Banu Tay, um, and specifically from the family of Banu Nabhan. So his father was Arab. And of course, Arabs, they established lineage, as Islam affirms as well. Arabs, they established, even pre-Islamically, they established lineage through the father. So in the eyes of the Arabs, he was Arab. From his mother, however, belonged to Banu Nadir, which was a Jewish tribe. And as the Jews, as the Jews they established lineage through the mother, he was accepted as one of Banu Nadir, he was accepted as a Jew amongst the Jews. And so he was a very interesting individual who was able to maintain uh, a very high rank and status in both families, uh, in both communities, excuse me. And his father was not just an individual of an Arab tribe, he was from the leadership of the Arab tribe. His grandfather had actually been one of the chiefs of Banu Nadir. And so because of this, this was somebody who held very high rank in both communities. On top of that, he himself was known to be um, just in terms of physical features, obviously, in terms of gaining prominence, he was known to be very tall, he was very handsome. Um, in terms of his uh, abilities, he was literate, he knew how to read and write. Um, not, and that was, while that was common amongst the Jews, that was very rare amongst the Arabs. So he was educated. He was actually a very talented poet. Um, and his, he was very well known for his poetry, he would be hired for his poetry. Um, so, and he had inherited a lot of lands right outside of Medina, some of the lands of Banu Nadir, he had inherited them from his grandfather. So he owned lots of very valuable land. He was a poet, which basically made him a celebrity at that time. Um, he was very politically connected in two different communities, the, you know, some of the Arab tribes and in the Jewish community. So this was somebody who enjoyed a lot of basically status and luxury. Um, and he was a very prominent individual. So he was used to basically getting his way. And he was used to being able to make anything happen that he wanted to make happen. After the Battle of Badr, again, he was very agitated by the Battle of Badr as well. He was agitated, of course, with the arrival of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, the you know, spread of Islam, and basically Medina basic, uh, becoming a Muslim city. He was agitated by all of that, but once the Battle of Badr occurred, now he was very bothered by all of this. So, many different historians, Imam Bukhari in his Sahih mentions this, uh, Ibn Ishaq, he mentions this, Ibn Kathir mentions this, um, and so, and also Imam al-Bayhaqi in Dala'il al nubuwa also mentions this, that Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, basically after the Battle of Badr, he got in touch with the Quraysh. He got in touch with the Quraysh, and he actually paid a visit to Mecca, and he, being having some type of celebrity status, you know, he was able to gather people together. He said, I'd like to speak to the leadership here in Mecca, the leadership of the Quraysh. So they said, sure. They kind of gave him an audience. They got everybody together for him. And he addressed everyone by saying, Wallahi la in kana Muhammadun asabaha ula'il qawm labadnu al-ardi khayru min dhahriha. That he said, if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is able to defeat you people, then we're better off being in the ground than being on top of the ground. Like we should all just die fighting him if Muhammad is, وسلم, is going to be able to you know, defeat even the Quraysh. Um, and it said that he conducted a campaign in Mecca. He went and resided there in Mecca. There are even some narrations that say that he was paid by some of the Quraysh to even 
uh, conduct this campaign, but he conducted a campaign where not only he incited the Meccans against the Muslims, but he also conducted a fundraising campaign to encourage everyone to contribute to the war fund to be able to build an army up to attack the Muslims. And so all of this is mentioned in the narration. فَأَنزَلَتُ وَأَكْرَمَتُ He basically went to Atika bint Abil Is. فَأَنزَلَتُ وَأَكْرَمَتُ وَجَعَلَ يُحَرِّدُ عَلَى قِتَالِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَيُنْشِدُ الْأَشْعَارِ وَيَنْدُبُ مَنْ قُتِلَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ يَوْمَ بَدْرِ فَذَكَرَ إِبْنِ إِسْحَاقَ قَصِيدَتَهُ الَّتِي أَوَّلُهَا طَحَنَتْ رَحَا بَدْرٍ لِمَهْلِكِ أَهْلِهِ وَلِمِثْلِ بَدْرٍ تَسْتَهِلُّ وَتَدْمَعُ He says that, you know, my heart still burns because of the people who died at Badr. My heart still aches for the people who fell at Badr from amongst the Quraysh. And he says that what happened at Badr is such that we should never stop crying over it. We should continue to mourn, we should continue to be angered, we should continue to be pained by what happened at Badr. So, Hassan bin Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu also mentions that, ثُمَّ عَادَ إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ فَجَعَلَ يُشَبِّبُ بِنِسَاءِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَيَهْجُ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم وَأَصْحَابَهُ And so, after he got everyone riled up in uh, Mecca, and basically got a war campaign started, which resulted in which resulted in Uhud. So he is the instigator of Uhud. He then came back to Medina, he told the Makkans, he said, now let me go back to Medina and do what I do over there. So he comes back to Medina and he starts inciting and instigating fights within Medina um, by you know, inciting some of the old rivalries in Medina between Aus and Khazraj. One of the other things that he was very notorious for was harassing Muslim women in Medina. He would kind of sneak out at night or you know, go out and cover up and harass Muslim women to just create some unrest in Medina, create some paranoia in Medina that the streets of Medina are not safe. He started you know, uh, slandering the Prophet وسلم, slandering many of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum um, and started creating all these problems. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to know about that Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf single-handedly is basically trying to incite war, the Prophet ﷺ, you know, gathered some of the individuals of the tribe of Aus. Um, and he basically said, he asked them that, this is the problem that we have right now. Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf is trying to um, rile up Mecca to attack Medina. On top of that, he's creating all this you know, unrest in the streets of Medina. We need to handle this problem. So one of the Ansar, Muhammad bin Maslama, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who's from the Aus, he said, Ya Rasulullah, let me go ahead and handle this. But he said, if I have to, if I have to, you know, um, employ certain tactics in order to be able to handle this situation. Do I have, is it alright if I do what I have to do? And the Prophet ﷺ said, عَلَيْكَ بِالْجَهَدْ You know, you do what you have to do. I'm not going to get in your way. I'm not going to tell you what to do. So at this particular time, Muhammad bin Maslama, he says, okay. So he says, let me recruit a couple of people. So one of the Ansar, his name was Abu Na'ilah. Um, his name is actually Silkan, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he recruits Abu Na'ilah, whose name is Silkan. And the reason why he recruits him is actually very interesting, it's fascinating. This Sahabi Abu Na'ilah, radiallahu anhu, was nursed by the same woman that Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf had been nursed by. So f because of that, he was his foster brother, his rada'i brother, his milk brother. So he was his foster brother. So he knew that if somebody can get me through the door, it's Abu Na'ila. That's the closest ally that I, that's the closest I can get to Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf. One of the other things I wanted to mention, Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, that huge property he had inherited, he had basically built a fortress on it. It's, this man's notions of grandeur were like out of control. He had built a fortress for himself. He lived inside of a fortress. And so he said that the, the closest I can get to him is Abu Na'ila. So he got Abu Na'ila and a couple of other buddies from Aus together, a couple of other of the Ansar. And 
they head on over to visit Ka'bun al-Ashraf. So this is where it gets um, very interesting and you kind of learn a little bit more about Ka'bun al-Ashraf. So they go to visit him and Muhammad bin Abu Na'ila makes the introductions. He says, you know, I wanted to come visit you. He's like, absolutely brother, it's nice to have you, etc, etc. And he says, I wanted to introduce you to my friend. Um, who wanted to meet you. He asked me to introduce you to him. Um, so he said, sure. He says, this is Muhammad bin Maslama. So Muhammad bin Maslama says that, look, we have a little bit of a problem. We have a problem. In هَذَا rajul قَدْ سَأَلَنَا صَدَقَةً وَإِنَّهُ قَدْ عَنَّانَا وَإِنِّي قَدْ آتَيْتُكَ أَسْتَسْلِفُكَ So he says that, look, this man, this man, he's basically speaking about the Prophet ﷺ. Muhammad bin Masama, these are the tactics. He says, this man who has come to our community, and we followed him in one other narration, he says, Inna qad ittaba'nahu, we followed him. Fala nuhibbu an nada'ahu hatta nandura ila ayy shay'in yasiru sha'nuhu. We want to stick it out with him. You know, we agree with him, we believe in what he says, but at the same time, we're dealing with a lot of difficulty. We have poverty at our doorstep. We're dealing with a lot of financial hardship. You know, the Arabs have picked up weapons against us. We're at war with Quraysh and Mecca now. And so we're dealing with hard times. So what I'm trying to tell you is that I'm with him, but I do have a difficult situation, and I'm not sure how things are going to pan out, how things are going to play out. But in the meantime, I was wondering if you could assist me and help me. And so basically, I want to borrow some money from you. But I'll be indebted to you, I'll pay you back, I'm good for it. You know, and I, you know, this is definitely gonna earn you a lot of influence in my community. I've, I'll vouch for you. You know, your influence will grow, your network will grow, etc, etc. So he has this whole conversation with him. So he says, sure, okay, I don't mind lending you some money, but irhanuni. You have to put down something as a security deposit. You have to play, Rahan is a security deposit, but with the Arabs specifically, the security deposit would be some type of valuable, and a lot of times it would be a sword, or an armor, or a shield. The Prophet ﷺ himself, when he, the day he passed away, the Prophet ﷺ still had an armor that was kept by somebody as a security deposit. For a loan, the Prophet ﷺ had taken. But the armor the Prophet ﷺ had put was worth more than the loan that he had taken. That was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. What he would put down as a security deposit was always worth more than the money he was borrowing. Right? So nevertheless, he says, put down some type of security deposit. He says, okay, wa shay in turid. What would you like? So he says, irhanuni nisa'akum. So he says, why don't you bring your wife and drop her off at my place? I'll hold your wife as a security deposit. Right? Very disrespectful, obviously. Um, and so he says, كَيْفَ نَرْحَنُكَ nisa'ana?" And so Muhammad bin Maslama probably was thinking to himself, like, I should just take care of this right now. But he said, you know, I, I don't have my weapons on me, etc. So I gotta play cool here, I gotta handle this situation. I'm dealing with this wretched human being, but let me keep my cool, right? Keep my head about me and handle my business here. So he says, كَيْفَ نَرْحَنُكَ نِسَاءَنَا How can I come and leave my wife here with you? وَأَنْتَ أَجْمَلُ الْعَرَبِ You know, you, you're such a baller, mashallah, right? And so, how am I going to leave my wife here with you? She's not going to want to come back home with me then, right? So, he says, alright, alright, I get it. You know, I am a baller, what am I supposed to do, right? I can't help it, right? So then he says, فَرْحَنُونِي أَبْنَاءَكُمْ So why don't you leave your children here with me as a security deposit? I'll put them in a corner somewhere. Like they're domesticated animals, right? Like they're pets, right? I'll tie them up in a corner somewhere. Leave your kids here with me. He said, كَيْفَ نَرْحَنُكَ أَبْنَاءَنَا He says, come on, brother. How am I going to leave my kids here with you as a security deposit? Right? فَيَسُبُّ أَحَدُهُمْ Right? فَيُسَبُّ أَحَدُهُمْ People will curse them. People will be like, hey, you know you? You know you? Your father left you with somebody as a security deposit. That's what you're worth. That's how much your daddy loved you, right? So he's like, I can't do that to my kids. Come on, think about it. A little bit of Izza, right? So he says, okay, okay, I got you. I get it. So he says that, you know, what, 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 else, what else can you leave as a security deposit? You people don't have anything else. Poor farmers. Look at you, ragged, tattered. What else are you going to leave? So now Muhammad bin Maslama says, I was hoping the conversation would get here. Because this was my plan. He said, look, you know us, Aus and Khazraj. We're fighters. We're farmers. We don't own anything, but we are fighters. 
We got swords and shields and armors. That's basically what we have, right? We plan dates and we polish our swords. That's what we do, right? So he says, how about we leave our weapons with you, silahna, right? With you as rahan. So he says, okay, might as well, that works for me. So he says, great, fantastic. So we'll come by tomorrow day after with our weapons and we'll leave it with you as a security deposit. Now this gives him an excuse to bring weapons through the door. Because he lived in a fortress. So the way that he used to operate was that he had guards at the door, at the gates, and you would have to leave your weapons with the guard. But how do you get weapons in? Well, this is how you get weapons in. We're bringing it as a security deposit. Right? So you can inspect them and you can check them and see them. So he says, great, fantastic. They come by the following nights, and um, Abu Na'ila, Basically, you know, they come and says, who's there? Abu Na'ila is there. So, Ka'ab bin al-Ashraf is informed, Abu Na'ila is here to see you, right, your brother. So he starts getting out of bed. And what's very fascinating is that his wife actually, um, you know, grabs him and says that, don't go. And see, this is the other thing, right? The, I, I, I'm, I'm going to talk more about this towards the end of it. But the story of Ka'ab bin al-Ashraf is twisted by two opposite extremes. It's twisted by some of the Khariji, you know, militant extremist types who basically say, look, the second anybody says anything that you don't like, done. Take them out. Right? This was a poet. He said something disrespectful about the Prophet ﷺ. Took him out. Incorrect. Right? And similarly, the story of Ka'ab bin al-Ashraf is also twisted by the opposite extreme. Right? Islamophobes and people who, Orientalists earlier, now Islamophobes these days, and people who try to misportray or slander Islam, they basically, they use the same story and they actually use the same exact rhetoric. They're like, look, the second somebody said something, Muhammad sallallahu didn't like, they would take him out. And it's incorrect because his, when he's leaving the bed, his wife actually says, because it's nighttime, she says that, Aina Tadha, where are you going? And he says, Hada akhi Abu Na'ila. Hada akhi wa radi'i Abu Na'ila. This is my foster brother, Abu Na'ila. So she actually says to him at that time, which is fascinating, she says, Anta rajulun, muhar, anta rajulun muharibun. You're a man who's declared war. You are a man who has declared war. Why would his wife be saying you are a man who has declared war? Because he had declared war. He single-handedly instigated an entire battle. Right? He single-handedly was keeping a war alive. Right? So this is, this is somebody that in every sense of the word is an enemy, uh, an enemy combatant. Right? This is not somebody who just decided to write an editorial piece. It's not somebody who just, you know, came up with some poems in which he maybe said some distasteful things about the Prophet ﷺ. As bad as that is, but what we need to understand over here is that, no, 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 he was involved in an act of war. He had declared war against Medina and against the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims. So she actually says that, أَنْتَ رَجُلٌ مُحَارِبٌ وَإِنَّ أَصْحَابِ الْحَرْبِ لَا يَنْزِلُونَ فِي هَذِهِ السَّاعَةِ Subhanallah. She says, أَنْتَ رَجُلٌ أَنْتَ إِمْرُؤٌ مُحَارَبٌ وَإِنَّ أَصْحَابِ الْحَرْبِ لَا يَنزِلُونَ فِي هَذِي السَّاعَةِ When you are at war, you don't go outside of your house at this hour of the night. Right? Subhanallah. Think about it. This is all in the text. This is all in the text. This is why our scholars, they place so much, our teachers, they place so much emphasis on going back to the source material. When you read Ibn Ishaq, and you read Ibn Kathir, and you read Al-Waqidi, and you read the earliest sources of the seerah, the most authentic sources of seerah, the answers are all there. It's not a cut and paste job. That's what the internet is full of. But what we need is an actual return to the source, to the text itself. Right? So she's saying, أَنْتَ إِمْرُؤٌ مُحَارَبٌ وَإِنَّ أَصْحَابِ الْحَرْبِ لَا يَنزِلُونَ فِي هَذِي السَّاعَةِ Ah, when you're at war, you don't go outside at this time of the night, buddy. And so... He says, no, 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 this is uh, Abu Na'ila. إِنَّهُ أَبُو Na'ila لَوْ وَجَدَنِي نَائِمًا مَا أَيْقَذَنِي He says that if I was sleeping, he wouldn't even wake me up. Abu Na'ila, you ever seen Abu Na'ila? He wouldn't hurt a fly. Gentle man. Gentle, gentle soul. Right? If he found me sleeping, he wouldn't even wake me up. He'd be like, oh no, I don't want to wake him up. He would sit there and wait for me to wake up. That's Abu Na'ila, what are you talking about? Let me go. So he wraps himself up. 
He goes outside. So they bring the weapons and they're like, here are the weapons and everything that we've brought um, for the Darah and the security deposits. So he says, okay, great. And um, the narration, uh, Muhammad bin Maslama radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, كانت ليلة مقمرة It was a night with the full moon. It was very bright outside, beautiful, huge. The moon was huge, looked huge, right? So we kind of said that, why don't we go for a little walk in, in the moonlight, right? Just go walk, talk, reminisce, talk about old days, old times. So he says, sure, absolutely. So he said, we started kind of walking around outside the fortress. We had all our weapons with us and everything. And so as we're walking, of course this man, right? He was wealthy, uh, famous, celebrity, prominent, etc. So he really, you know, kind of used to spoil himself in that regard, take care of himself like that. So he had long flowing hair. And his hair smelled really, really nice. Because he used to put like, you know, uh, perfume in his hair. And so, uh, Abu Naila basically said to him, being a brother, you know, he said, man, your hair smells amazing. Right? So, what do you put in your hair? What kind of shampoo do you use? Right? So, he's like, oh, you know, I put some perfume in this and that. And he's like, oh, it's amazing. So he says, do you mind if I smell your hair? Right? Let me check it out. So he says, yeah, sure, brother, no problem, right? These are weird brothers, right? So he says, yeah, sure, brother, no problem. So he puts his head down, and Abu Na'ila grabs his head. And then he tells Muhammad bin Maslama, and I, I forgot who else was with them. Um, he tells him, go for it. And they, and I want to mention this, and I'm going to give a disclaimer before I mention it. What I'm about to mention, and I will describe it from the text, but I will explain exactly what it says, right? And so I will explain it in as plain words as I can. But I'm, the disclaimer I'm going to give you is that my intention is not, well, ayadu billah, God forbid, it's not even permissible for us to do so. My intention is not to make fun of or to mock the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But it is for a very specific reason and purpose that I'm going to translate it and explain it as explicitly as I'm going to. So he says that, you know, he grabs his head and he says that, Idribu uh, adu Allah, kill him. So he says, فَاخْتَلَفَتْ عَلَيْهِ أَسْفِيَافُهُمْ فَلَمْ تُغْنِي شَيْئًا Two, three guys, they all got out their swords and they all went at the same time and their swords hit each other and Ka'ab bin al is still standing there like, are you kidding me? Right? Like again, not to mock. But what I'm saying is like, you know, if there's like a pop fly, ball popped up in the air in the outfield, two, three different people running towards the ball to catch it, and what happens? If they're amateurs, like me, then they run into each other. And nobody catches the ball. These were not trained, skilled assassins. You see, I'm not making fun of the Sahaba. Well, ayatu billah. That's not even permissible. What I'm saying is that the Sahaba, this portrayal that the Orientalists, that the Islamophobes after them, that even these uh, extremists, the rhetoric that they have, the portrayal that they've made of the Sahaba and of this particular incident, as if these Muslims were these cold, hard assassins, right? They were these mysterious, super trained, super skilled assassins that would like fall, out, step out of the shadows, right? Take you out and then ret retreat back into the shadows and disappear. Oh, you said something about the Prophet ﷺ? Done, finished, right? That, that's, the, that's kind of the mental image that they've tried to portray both extremes. The crazy extremists and the anti-Muslim camp. They both have the same portrayal of the Sahaba, these assassins. These were, the Sahaba were who? These Ansar? Like I said, they were farmers. They were family men. They had wives, they had children, elderly parents they looked after. Then what happened once they accepted Islam? Then they became worshippers. Tarahum ruka an sujjadan yabtahuna fadlam min Allahi wa ridwana. Si mahum fi wujuhihim min athar sujud. 
You, every time you look at them, you see them in ruku', you see them in sujood, you see them praying. That's who the Sahaba were. That's who these Ansar were. Or skilled assassins. So when the opportunity came, they all got out their swords, kind of fumbling with their swords, and they're all swords clanked against each other. And Abu Na'il is holding him like, what are you guys doing? And so then they again go at it. And one of them actually ends up stabbing another one of them. Al-Harith ibn, ibn Aus, he was one of the other ones. Al-Harith ibn Aus, one of the other Muslims ends up stabbing one of the other Muslims. Friendly fire. Right? So one Muslim stabs another Muslim by accident. Mrs. Ka'b bin al-Ashraf gets another Muslim. And now he's been stabbed in the leg with the sword. And he's screaming. He's like, what are you doing? The other guy's like, what are y'all doing? Right? So finally, some way, somehow, Muhammad bin Maslama regains kind of some control of the situation and plunges his sword into Ka'b bin al-Ashraf. And finally, the whole ordeal is over. Like if you saw this play out, you could tell that these are not trained killers. Right? They were trying to avoid a war. That eventually did happen. Right? And took the lives of 70 Sahaba. That's what they were trying to avoid. Right? Because this man single-handedly was making that war happen. And so this is how they killed Ka'b bin al-Ashraf. They say some way, somehow... We make it back to the Prophet ﷺ carrying the one guy who's been stabbed in the leg. We come back to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ sees us covered in blood. One guy's bleeding out of his leg. Right? We're all like nervous and freaked out like all of us are pale. And he's like, is everything okay? He says, everything's alright. Deed is done, Ya Rasulullah. He says, okay, alhamdulillah. And then the Prophet ﷺ then of course makes dua, he applies his saliva to the wound of uh, Al-Harith ibn al-Aws, right? As the Mu'ajiza of the Messenger wasallam, the miraculous act, how he could heal people like that. Um, and so that basically is the incident of Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf. And that basically did put, there were some other instigators. We talked about Banu Qaynuqa. There were also some instigators of war amongst Banu Nadir that basically put everyone else on notice. So it did accomplish the purpose in the sense of anyone else that was trying to instigate war immediately got quiet, immediately stopped and said, you know what, we better stop. Because these people will basically take whatever measures they have to in order to be able to protect the sanctity of their homes, the sanctity of their community, the sanctity of their lives. Right, so this was the incident of Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf. And so I ended up talking about it in the middle. But this is exactly what I wanted to comment at the very end. Is that the rhetoric surrounding the incident of Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, Qatru Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, the assassination or the killing of Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf is something that, you know, by both opposite camps, by both extreme camps, is portrayed in a very, um, you know, false light is very falsely portrayed, right? Where both sides want to present it as these were Muslims assassinating anybody who would dare say anything that they did not approve of. When that was the farthest thing from the truth, Gabin Mulashraf had declared war, had instigated war, had single-handedly raised an army in Mecca to attack the Muslims, which became the Battle of Uhud, right? And on top of that, even in the incident, you are able to see that the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, killing was the thing that they were not good at. Right? They could worship. They were worshippers. They were people who were devout. They were people who were dedicated. They were people who were, you know, um, committed. People who were pious and righteous. Good family people. Farmers, hardworking, salt of the earth. Right, people who got their hands dirty with their own work. That's who they were. Right? They weren't trained killers and, and assassins. And you're able to see this from this particular incident. So when you go back to the original source text, such as Ibn Ishaq, Waqidi, Tabari, Ibn Kathir, and you go back to these source texts, you're able to find the truth of the matter and the exact reality behind the killing of Ka'bun al-Ashraf. And that, I believe, was... I'm not sure if I mentioned the date... Um, it was, of course, during the third year of the Prophet's residence in the city of Medina. And 
I do not have the date in front of me, but obviously it was after Jumad al-Ula, but prior um, to Shawwal, so somewhere in between there, either during the month of Rajab or Sha'ban, was when Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf was killed, was assassinated, um, and that still was not enough uh, in order to be able to prevent the Battle of Uhud. So insha'Allah, in the coming session, we will start talking about the Battle of Uhud and the, uh, the, the days leading up to the battle and then the battle itself, insha'Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability and the tawfiq to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.